The following message is brought to you by the Kantaro Institute. To learn more about the Kantaro Institute's mission to advance the Christian philosophy of life, please visit www.kantaroinstitute.org. So what has Wittenberg to do with Florence, if you like, the birth of modern times? And I realize I would not have that much time to explore the modern times, because that's a lot of ground to cover. So to begin with, I would say um, when I was in college, the concept that I was most that was most in vogue was this concept that I'm sure you heard about, which is postmodernity, and its derivatives, postmodernism or postmodern. It was a kind of trend to start off a presentation or a discussion by saying, "In these postmodern times or days." And I'm sure many of us had no clue of what that concept meant. We assumed that if all our, our professors were using it, it must be right. After a while, I realized that I was using the concept of postmodernity without even knowing what modernity me meant. So I'm talking about postmodernity, but what modernity meant. So I decided to spend some, uh, some time studying what authors meant by modernity or modern times. <clears throat> but then another problem crossed my path. The concept of modernity was developed to oppose, so to speak, another time in history, the so-called Middle Ages. So could I understand what modernity was without grasping something of, uh, something of the previous period, the so-called Middle Ages? Well, I came to, to, to the realization that I was dealing with a much bigger problem And I would say that's history itself, the problem of history, how to read history. Historical knowledge uh, doesn't deal um, only with the past. Interpreting history implies also an interpretation of the present and of the future. In other words, what I'm saying is that historical knowledge does not interpret itself. It is not just pure objective facts. We need a meta-narrative, if you like, a worldview, to be able to make sense of history. We need a reference point through which we can measure things. What I'm saying is that reality is both objective, I'm not denying that at all, but it's also subjective in, in many senses. Therefore, in the same way that we battle uh, and fight over the interpretation of the now with a variety of narratives, theories, images that are brought to explain it, the past is fought for in the same manner. How do you think Napoleon would have interpreted history if he had conquered Waterloo? My point is that our view of history, past, present, and future, is never neutral. It is always informed by a bigger narrative, The biblical one, or an ideology, a progress through technology, humanism, different kinds of philosophies, etc. C.S. Lewis, in his in inaugural lecture as the chair of medieval and Renaissance literature at Cambridge, said, <clears throat> From the formula, medieval and Renaissance, then, I infer that the university was encouraged my own belief that the, the barrier between those two ages has been greatly exaggerated, if indeed it was not largely a figment of humanist propaganda. At the very least, I was ready to welcome any increased flexibility in our conception of history. All lines of demarcation between what we call periods should be subject to constant revision. With that, we could dispense with them altogether. As a great Cambridge historian has said, unlike dates, periods are not facts. They are retrospective conceptions that we form about past events, useful to focus discussion, but very often leading historical thought astray. But unhappily, we cannot, as historians, dispense with periods. We cannot hold together huge masses of particulars without putting into them some kind of structure. So I think that's very important to highlight. We have objective dates and events, 
But the way we categorize, the way we interpret and, and say that's this spirit, and we name this spirit, they are not neutral. With that in mind, I approach these historical events, aware that there are many aspects that one could bring to our discussion, many of which will be left out in this coming hour. One could approach the topic from different angles, political, economic, theological, philosophical, artistic, and so forth. My goal this evening is to reflect about three aspects that were and are fundamental if we want to have more clarity in the way we understand history. But before I unfold a little bit my main goal, I just want to say uh, for those of you that might be wondering about the title of, of this lecture, so what has Wittenberg to do with Florence? And these two cities, one in Germany, the, the stars, they point out where they are. Unfortunately, I couldn't find one, a modern one with Wittenberg on the map. <laughs> Such a small, small town in Germany. And Florence is more well-known, it's down there in Italy. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> they, the, both of them are very representative of two important movements, the Reformation and the Renaissance. Obviously, there are other places that could be referred to as important hubs of, Reform of the Reformation and the Renaissance, such as Geneva, Zurich, Cambridge, Siena, Venice, Rotterdam, and so on. But Wittenberg is very well known because uh, there Luther wrote and nailed his 95 Theses. And we have someone dressed as Luther tonight here. <laughs> that became emblematic within the Reform Movement. And it's interesting that we are celebrating this 500 years of the Reformation this year, but there's no particular day to celebrate the Renaissance. And we, we could wonder tonight what would that be, maybe 1516 uh, uh, when, when uh, Erasmus published his New Testament, or when Machiavelli in 1513 published the book The Prince, so uh, the founder of political sciences, we don't know. Or when the Sistine Chapel was painted by Raphael Michelangelo, we don't know. But we don't have a fixed date for that. And Florence was the place where many artists, such as Leonardo da Vinci, lived and worked, as well as many other Renaissance philosophers and thinkers, some of whom I'd like to present to you tonight. That's why Wittenberg, because of Luther mainly, but I'm not saying that's the, the only place of the Reformation. And that's why Florence, because so many artists and philosophers live there. So going back to my main goal, I'd like to use the metaphor of a camera. And with uh, that camera, I want to show you three pictures that no, not only myself, but people and authors in the last 500 years have been taking about this historical period. And I want to divide this, this a little bit. So we have, we will look very briefly on uh, the sociological, theological, slash philosophical, and anthropological um, picture of the late Middle Ages, and the three pictures of the Renaissance, and three pictures of the Reformation. And hopefully, by the end of this talk, my, my hope is that you, you can say, yeah, I understand a little bit better what was the Reformation, what was the Renaissance and the connection of them and the similarities and the, the things that they, they can tell about mo the modern world and about our world. That's, that's my, my hope. I'll be satisfied if you can say that by the end. <clears throat> the medieval time was a very rich and complex time in European history. <coughs> Unfortunately, for so many people, the only thing they associate this time with is with the expression Dark Ages. And I don't know, maybe you have come across this, the Middle Ages just as Dark Ages. Some people divide saying that's the, just the early Middle Ages. I remember my history teacher in primary school telling us that nothing good had happened in this time of history, which one could challenge, so to, to, to say the least, saying that this is a very unfair and even a naive statement. To say that, nevertheless, is not to say that there was a golden age, but it's to acknowledge the complexity of this time. Historians normally define the Middle Ages from a period that goes from the 5th century with the fall of Rome to the 15th century 
with the fall of Constantinople and the Byz Byzantine Empire, as well as with the rise of the Renaissance. So we have here roughly a thousand years. So that's a lot. Historians, they tend to divide the Middle Ages in three different periods as well. So we have the early Middle Ages. Some characteristics would be the Christianization of the West, an increase in immigration, feudalism based on agriculture, and we would have the high Middle Ages, uh, rural exodus and urbanization, the Crusades, creation of universities, so Bologna, Paris, Oxford, later Cambridge, and the centralization of the Roman Church. And then we would have the late Middle Ages that we'll look a little bit more closely tonight. So to think about the late Middle Ages, the first picture, very briefly, I want to give you is this sociological picture. The church was the center of life then. I was hearing uh, someone speaking about the Reformation, and this guy was saying, well, you know, Luther was Catholic, because that, that, that was the church that was most um, propagated around. Mm -hmm. Well, we, one could not have, did not have many options, I would say. So it concentrated both the political, the church, the political and religious power. Yes, salvation was only through Christ, but the med med mediation was through the church. So in the official theology of the church, salvation was through Christ, but we will see through the mediation of the church. And that mediation was expressed through the ad administration of the sacraments, which only someone under Rome could administrate and receive. So you have baptism, chrismation, eucharistic, penance, matrimony, holy orders, anointing of the sick, that they would, would call also the extreme unction. So we have the other characteristics, the urbanization of Europe. We have the establishment of the so-called Christendom, would be the Europe as Christ's kingdom on earth, on, on earth. So as I said, political and religious power were one. In the 14th century, there was this um, the div division within the Roman Catholic Church. So there was for roughly 30, 40 years, two popes, one in Italy and one in France. In the beginning of the 16th century, we have the, the, the project that was conceived in the middle of the, the 15th century of the, the St. Peter's Basilica. There was a, a way of reuniting the church in Rome. And we'll look closer to that in a minute. And a and, uh, great part of the, the money that was used to build St. Peter's Basilica came from the selling of indulgences. From a, a theological point of view, we could say that the theological landscape was dominated by scholasticism. There were divisions within this movement, but with no doubt, the main name was Thomas Aquinas. The understanding of these theologians that one could not be a theologian, theologian without the aid of the so-called great philosopher, who was Aristotle. So we call it an Aristotelian scholastic system of theology and philosophy. Aquinas operated a synthesis between Greek philosophy and Christianity based on a division of reality between nature and grace. And here, I use a little bit of Hermann Doiver. I could not leave him out of that. So according to Doiver, Aquinas' uh, first attempt was to defend the idea that reason is rooted in God and that natural reason would be perfectly integrated with biblical doctrine once that the capacity for reason was rooted in God. Nevertheless, Aquinas separated reality into two, the realm of nature, which we would correspond to, to the natural and visible world, matter, if you like, and within this realm, reason was given a relative autonomy. Human reason could get to really know and understand the world without the aid of grace. Obviously, Aquinas affirmed that this natural knowledge would never contradict God's revelation. On the other hand, we would have the realm of grace as opposed to nature, the supernatural reality, the invisible. 
Here we have theology as the main subject, whereas nature would be studied mainly through philosophy. So, for many authors, including Teuven and Schaefer, uh, for Aquinas, uh, he would have created a natural theology with, that would rely on reason as a way of knowing God. But that opened up a door for an autonomous reason that would be developed with the Renaissance and later on with humanism. So that would be the theological picture. The anthropological one, the view of man, who is man, who is a human person. I have a, here a quote from my Labri, fellow Labri worker in Brazil, Rodolfo. He said that in their view, man was understood as a rational soul, lacking the original justice. He, therefore, man, he must seek God through the means of grace, the sacraments administrated by the church in order to find salvation. And man was split between nature and grace. Man was to find freedom in Christ, but was heavenly dependent on the church. And that Schaefer from Escape from Reason, he, he says in Aquinasville, the will of man was fallen, but the intellect was not. From this incomplete view of the biblical fall, flowed subsequent difficulties. Out of this, as time passed, man's intellect was seen as autonomous. This fear of autonomous growing out of Aquinas takes on various forms. One result, for, for example, was the development of natural theology. In this view, natural theology is a theology that could be pursued independently from, scriptures, from the scriptures. Aquinas certainly hoped for unity and would have said that there was a correlation between natural theology and the scriptures. From the basis of this autonomous principle, philosophy also became increasingly free and was separated from revelation. So having said that, let's move on now to the, actually the core of this lecture, so the Renaissance. Are you following me? So far? Okay. Is that a good speed, rhythm? Good. Do you know this picture, this portrait, this yeah. art here? So that, that's, if you've been to, to Rome, specifically to the Vatican, you, you saw that on your way to the Sistine Chapel. That's uh, in the Vatican, painted by uh, Raphael. Am I right? Yeah, Raphael. The, it's called the School of Athens. Athens. So we have here... Plato, Aristotle, and a bunch of other philosophers that we don't have time to explore now. And Raphael himself is here. Where is he? Here. There we go. That's Raphael here. <clears throat> so a sociological picture of the Renaissance. The word Renaissance, it's a French word that means rebirth. So Renaissance means rebirth. And in one sense, as a movement, it cannot be completely separated from the Roman Catholic Church. Some authors even claim that the Renaissance was the Catholic Church Reformation, as it brought renewal for the Church in many senses. As I mentioned earlier, the Roman Catholic Church dominated the landscape of Europe through religious festivals, feasts, holy days, processions, pilgrimage to the Holy Land and to various shrines across Europe, like Canterbury Cathedral or and Winchester Cathedral in England, mystery plays, and so forth. Some, some people say that some signs of vitality of the Roman Church at the time was the reaffirmation of the papacy as a way to reunite the Church. So, under Pope Nicholas V in 1450, the idea of reuniting Christendom came about through the project of rebuilding of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. There was a church there before, so they wanted to expand that and reunite the uh, the Christian Europe through the building of this basilica. So examples of, of, of this were <clears throat> the founding of the Vatican Library in 1475, the largest library in Europe, and the major um, PayPal commission of, of great artists like Michelangelo, Raphael, and Botticelli. And we, we know these four uh, guys who were very famous in the Renaissance, Leonardo, uh, Raphael, Donatello, and Michelangelo. Some people say actually they are the, the, 
turtle, uh, the <laughs> ninjas, the ninjas, the turtles, yeah, the four of them, they are the main artists of the Renaissance. <clears throat> and here you have the Sistine Chapel. If, you, if you're planning, that's, that's a good place to be and visit. It's amazing. And while we could affirm the beauty of this painting, we could at the same time wonder where the money that did fund all these artists came from. As we know, the selling of indulgences was, was a very common mean to fundraising. Can you see some connections there? Can you start to see some connections between the Renaissance and the Reformation in one sense? So, what about Florence? At that time, Florence was a hub of humanist scholarship and artistic production, due largely to the funding of, a, of the powerful Medici family who by the end of the period exert their political and financial influence over much of central Italy. So very famous artists of that time, they concentrated there in Florence because of this wealthy family who has sponsored lots of artists, including Leonardo. It was in Florence that he painted uh, Gioconda, Mona Lisa. So that's why... Florence is so fundamental for us. You can name others. Sandro Botticelli, as I said already, Michelangelo, and philosophers like Marsilio Ficino, and Giovanni Pico della Mirandola, which I'll explain a little bit about him later. So we could say that the Renaissance was marked by an explosion in knowledge, creativity, and discovery in fields as diverse as history, cosmology, architecture, linguistics, geography, technology, mathematical and political theory. So that was a, way, a good way of defining sociologically what happened and what was the Renaissance. Theological and philosophical picture. And here things, they, they get a little bit connected with the sociological, theological picture of, of the late Middle Ages. <coughs> so although the church... The church mass, sorry, and instructions were still held in what language? Just, just to check, check here, in Latin. And actually, did you know that mass, the mass in Latin was uh, held by the Catholic Church until 1967? It's 1967, after the Second Vatican Council. So, <clears throat> although the, the church mass was still uh, held in Latin, the Renaissance humanists, not to be confused with later secular humanism, formed a network of scholars who had a strong motto that was ad fontes, and that means back to the sources. <clears throat> with a special interest in classical Greek, there was a rebirth of classic Greek-Roman culture. Many scholars started to read and interpret the New Testament in Greek, and they grew very critical towards scholasticism and the philosophy of Thomas Aquinas. So the Renaissance was critical towards the Middle Ages, if you want to call these periods like that. So the standard translation of the Bible widely used in the Middle Ages was St. Jerome's 5th century translation of the Bible in Latin, known as the, as the Vulgate, the Vulgata in Latin. So, in, in, the, in the Renaissance, in Florence, an Italian linguist called Lorenzo Valla com compared the Vulgate with the original Greek text and realized that some parts of it had been mistranslated and may have been misused by the church and its theologians, especially by Thomas Aquinas. And here we have two examples, two codices. So, metanoiete, for the kingdom of heaven is near, Jerome translated do penance instead of repent. So that might have given space for the sacrament of penance uh, be emphasized as, as, a, as a church sacrament instead of a personal repentance of, a, of the person. The other example of that is Gabriel greeted the Virgin Mary as Keshari Tomene, which Jerome translated full of grace instead of highly favored. So for this Renaissance man, that might have encouraged people the adoration of Mary, the Virgin Mary, and the other saints. So there was a lot of debate around the rebirth of the classic Greek and people reading 
things in the original language. In this context, an essential and important figure to understand the Renaissance was Erasmus of Rotterdam. He was born in the Netherlands, but was well-traveled around Europe. Erasmus was a classicist and a huge enthusiast of Saint Jerome and classical Greek. He was known as the Prince of Humanists. He worked hard in the revision and edition of both Greek and Latin New Testament. In 1516, Erasmus published his edition of the New Testament, published in Basel, Switzerland, in Greek. So the, this edition of the New Testament was in Greek, alongside a revised version of the Latin edition. So some people argue that 1516 might have been the kind of one of the marks of the Renaissance, the same way that 1517 with Luther nailed the Ninth Five Thesis was the mark of the Reformation. So maybe last year we should have celebrated or not celebrated, the, the, depending on the point of view, the Renaissance. <coughs> So Erasmus believed that the study of both languages would result in, in better translations for vernacular languages in the future. The work, this New Testament of Erasmus, was dedicated to Pope Leo X. Just note, was the same Pope that who, who would, just five years later, excommunicate Luther from the Catholic Church. So the same Pope that Erasmus dedicated his... Um, uh, New Testament in Greek was the Pope who excommunicated Luther. Erasmus in his Novum Testamentum the, the, the revised version of uh, Jerome's uh, Vulgata was not addressed just for theologians and academics. His agenda was to make the reading of the Bible more accessible to everyone. In the preface of his Novum Testamentum he wrote might sound a bit weird and different for us but he wrote I would that even the lowliest women read the Gospels and the Pauline epistles, and I would that they were translated into all languages so that they could be read and understood not only by Scots and Irish, but also by Turks and Saracens. <laughs> Erasmus, even remaining faithful to the end of his life to, to the Roman Catholic faith and its theology, was a very controversial figure. For some, he was a kind of Catholic reformer. For others, a proto-Protestant, or even both combined. His most famous book was a satire called The Praise of Folly, published in 1511 in Paris. In five years, it had 20 editions, and it was translated into several European languages. Folly derided the sea of superstitions surrounding popular piety, such as the worship of fictitious saints. She denounced the hypocrisy of those who lit candles to the Virgin Mary, yet cared nothing about emulating her chastity in life. Later on, Erasmus wrote a, an article called Julius Exclusus as a critique to Pope Julius II, who had just died. He was known as the warrior pope. And he, he, he makes up this encounter between uh, the Pope and St. Peter in heaven. So that's the conversation. Peter says to the Pope, You've brought 20,000 men with you, but not one of the whole mob looks like a Christian one. <laughs> they, see, they seem to be worse drags of humanity, all stinking of brothels, <coughs> booze, and gunpowder. I would say they were a gang of hired thugs. And the more closely I look at at you yourself, the less I can see any trace of an apostle. First, first of all, what monstrous new fashion is this to wear the dress of a priest on top, while underneath it, it, uh, underneath it you are all bristling and clanking with blood-stained armor? And Peter continues saying, I want countless thousands of souls for Christ. You led as many to destruction. I was the first to teach Christ to pagan Rome, you have, a, been a, you have been a teacher of paganism in Christian Rome. So the, the, it's very strong, isn't it? So the conversation goes on, and Julius, the Pope, tries to excommunicate St. Peter with a, papal, <laughs> with a papal bull. It doesn't work. 
And then he tries to gather an army to b break through the gates of heaven. So that's why the kind of the level of criticism that Erasmus was, was doing. But still, he remained a Catholic um, for the rest of his life. Right, let's go back to Florence. That's a very important character for the Renaissance. Um, a man who was born in Florence, Nic Niccolo Machiavelli. How many of you have heard of this, this guy? Oh, almost everybody. So he, he was born in Florence and lived his ho whole life there. He was a historian, a diplomat, philosopher, philosopher and writer. He was officially part of the government in Florence during the Florentine Republic. Machiavelli is known as the father of political sciences. So if you've studied social science or political science, Machiavelli is known as the first one to have started it, especially due to his most famous book called The Prince that was published in 1513. Some other people argue that that's the mark of the Renaissance. So The Prince is a political treatise addressed to Lorenzo di Medici, Another guy who was part of this wealthy family in Florence. So he was the ruler of Florence back then. The main aim of this treatise is to reflect about how to achieve power and how to stay in power. It's a very pragmatic book. He had in mind the unification of Italy. In it, power is thought of as a separate thing from ethics. So he separates politics from morality. He says these things are completely different things. It's from Machiavelli, the very famous phrase, the means justify the ends. Is that right? The, way yeah. 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 the means justify the ends. <clears throat> so in it, uh, sorry, so politics is divorced from morality. How things are and how they ought to be are split as different spheres. So he says, mm -hmm. ethics deals with how things ought to be. Politics deals with how things are. You've probably heard the expression Machiavellic or Machiavellian. That is a reference to Machiavelli's <laughs> pragmatic approach to power. Therefore, the, his famous phrase, the means justify the ends. A question that he would ask in the book for the ruler would be, is it better to be loved or to be feared? And that's the way he would answer that. It is much safer to be feared than, than loved, because love is preserved by the link of obligation, which, owing to the baseness of man, is broken at very opportunity for their advantage. But fear preserves you by a dread of punishment, which never fails. So if you, if you read, as I read a few times uh, the book, it's a short book, and it's a public domain. You can download it if you want to. Don't read in the evening. I, I recommend to you just in you know, a nice sunny morning, a Sunday with a cup of coffee might do. But he says, actually, it's better to be both. If you could be loved and feared, that's ideal. But it's, that's almost impossible. So it's better to be feared. The other thing he says, how we live is so different from how we ought to live that he who studies what ought to be done rather than what is done, will learn the way to his down, downfall, rather than to his preservation. So that's a clear message. It's a stretch of the Renaissance, in one sense, even against Christianity, saying Christianity is not part of power, of politics, because Christianity deals with things that ought to be, not how things work. So that's a clear thing of separation between, uh, of divide in life. Just, the last, sent, the last phrase for you from Machiavelli, he says, Any man who tries to be good all the time is bound to come to ruin among the great number who are not good. Hence, a prince who wants to keep his authority must learn how not to be good and use that knowledge or refrain from using it as necessity requires. So goodness is just another means to a particular end, in this case, to stay in power, or to achieve power. So there's a strong separation from eth ethics and power. So one could say that even if Machiavelli doesn't use the language of nature and grace, as Aquinas does, 
we could see in his humanistic impus, impus a very clear affirmation of political power being something that belongs to nature. And that's totally different from grace. So if you like, it's the beginning of nature taking over grace in terms of politics. Right, moving on. The anthropological picture. <clears throat> so who is man? What were the images of man that came about with the Renaissance? One could see the variety and complexity of different images through, through the arts. We could just reflect about, for example, this very thing here by Michelangelo, the creation of, of, of man, of Adam. So some people argue that even the idea of kind of a brain here, God as a rational, a rational being, creating man as rational, his image which is, reflects truth, but it's not kind of the only picture of who a uh, human person is. Or David by Michelangelo as well, which is, I think it's in Florence. Yeah, it's in Florence. Mm -hmm. But Schaefer observes something very interesting about that. Schaefer says that the David was the statement of what the humanistic man saw himself as being tomorrow. In this statue, we have man waiting with confidence in his own strength for the future. Humanism was standing its proud self, and the David stood as a representation of that. So that's not what it's not. And Schaefer argues that it's not just the David of, of the Bible, <laughs> the man after the, the man after God's heart, on heart, but it's the humanistic ideal of who man is. Or if you like, we have Leonardo with the Vitruvian man, this idea of a mathematical order, so man could be rationalized and rationally understood. So. Who are we in terms of uh, God's creation? So it's, it's a kind of contrast, isn't it? This image of kind of God creating, giving uh, man um, personality or spirit, if you like, and then this kind of very mathematical representation of man. But I want to present to you this guy. This is a very fundamental guy for the Renaissance. Pico, Giovanni Pico della Mirandola. I would just call him Pico, it's easier. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Pico was another guy from Florence. So that's why Florence is so fundamental. Um, he was born in a very wealthy family. And by the age of 23, listen well, by the age of 20, 23, he had mastered the following languages. Oh, sorry. Uh, Greek, Latin, Hebrew, Syriac, and Arabic. By the age of 23. He was very close, again, to the Medici family in Florence. And therefore, he had free access to the Pope as well. So he, is very, he would circulate well in, in Rome. <clears throat> in his 20s, Pico wanted to write 900 theses about everything. Theology, philosophy, cosmology, and arts, and so forth. And he challenged scholars from around the world, saying that uh, he would pay... Uh, their expenses if they would come to Florence to challenge the, his thesis. Apparently, nobody came. I don't know if they, they, they couldn't challenge. Was that just they didn't care about it? We don't know. <clears throat> As a preface to his 900 thesis, he wrote a book called The Dominis Dignitate, an oration on the dignity of man which I recommend to you as well, if you have some time, spare time. It's a very short book. It's very, very interesting. And <clears throat> in, in his oration, he attempted to remap the human landscape to center all attention on human capacity and human perspective. This famous Renaissance philosopher taught the amazing capacity of human achievement. Pico himself had a massive intellect and studied everything that was to be studied in the university curriculum of the Renaissance. The oration also is part of a, a, another uh, larger project he had that would be a, a compendium of all the intellectual achievements of humanity that he never finished because of his early death. His oration was known then as the Renaissance Manifesto. That's why it's so important to understand the Renaissance, to understand the, the thinking of Pico della Mirandola. So just a few quotes for you, for us. 
That's the very beginning. Most esteemed fathers, I have read in the ancient writings of the Arabians that Abdallah the Saracen, on being asked what, on this stage, so to say, of the world, seemed to him most evocative of wonder, replied that was nothing to be seen more marvelous than man. That's a very interesting thing, isn't it? So, the glory and the beauty and the ex exaltation of man. And he goes on saying, But upon man, at the moment of his creation, God bestowed seed pregnant with all possibilities, the germs of every form of life. If rational, he will reveal himself a heavenly being. If intellectual, he will be an angel and the son of God. Can you see the connections of the kind of anthropology he would propose? Man, as the glory of man. But who is man? Who is this anthropology? It's a rational, it's an intellectual perspective of what a, or who a human person is. And the other thing, he says, if however you see a philosopher, so even a bigger category here, judging and distinguishing all things according to the rule of reason, him shall you hold in veneration, for he is a creature of heaven and not of earth. <laughs> so that's his theme of philosophers, of, of the mind. So the mind is very important to define what the, the glory of a person. Was that clear? Can we move on? final part, the, the Reformation. Hold on there. <clears throat> so whereas the center of the Renaissance was taking place in the south of Europe, a different movement was taking shape in the north of Europe. And the small city of Wittenberg in Saxony would become the center of it. We don't have time to go in detail and depth about different aspects of the Reformation. Similar to the Renaissance, the Reformation was a complex series of ev events that had many different characters involved. But again, some of the pictures that were just presented here also portray aspects of the context of the Reformation. So they, they, they just oppose here. We will be reflecting mostly about the work of Luther, specifically on his 95 Thesis, not all of them. Five, I hope. I'll, I'll present five to you and just that will be enough. <clears throat> Although there are many important figures that cannot be left out if we think about the Reformation, in this sense it's important to name, for example, two men considered pre-reformers. John Wycliffe in the 13th century, a Catholic priest at Oxford University who defended that the Bible should be translated into the vernacular languages. <clears throat> So that's, that's, a, that's a book called The Truth of the Holy Scripture. His followers, known as the Lollards, Lollards, sorry guys, yeah, my second language here, produced an English translation of the Latin Vulgata in 1384. So he was very important for the Reformation. Wycliffe influenced another man in Prague, Jan Hus, that shared a concern for the Reformation within the church. For the sake of time, we won't have time to develop ideas about John Calvin, the reform of Geneva, William Tyndale, Cambridge reformer, if you like, or John Knox, the Scottish reformer, or Zwingli in Zurich, to name just a few. But we move on to the sociological picture of the Reformation. So we had the things we talked about, the Renaissance was going on in the south of Europe since the 15th century, even earlier. St. Peter's Basilica was being built. Indulgences was, were being sell, sold. So in the beginning of the, the 16th century, there was a lot going on. The Roman Catholic Church was still and was the center of life in, in Europe in many senses. And, and the Renaissance, although very connected in one sense to the church, was touching in very complicated issues like Erasmus did. And the need for change was becoming clearer. As a symptom of that, there was a council held by the church called the, the Lateran Council. It started in 1512 and lasted for five years until the emblematic year of 1517 in March that year. In the last session of the council, a nobleman and philosopher, again from Florence, a, a man named Gianfrancesco, Pico della Mirandola, Pico's nephew, 
addressed an oration to the Pope, urging him to take action. And these were his words. He said to the Pope, These diseases and these wounds must be healed by you, Holy Father. Otherwise, if you fail to heal these wounds, I fear that God himself, whose place on earth you take, will not apply a gentle cure, but with, the, with fire and sword will cut off those diseased members and destroy them. And I believe that he has already clearly given signs of his future remedy. Very interesting. That was 1517, just a few months after the ninth five thesis. So it's against this background that we have Luther's biography. And that's very interesting. He was born today, the 10th of November, uh, eight, uh, 1483, in this uh, town of I Eisleben in Germany. And I'll go through now very quickly his biography, just to give an idea, some suggestions of books if you want to read by Luther, and then I'll concentrate on the theological part, on the, the Ninth Five Thesis, and then we move on to our conclusion. <clears throat> so, in 1501, he went to the University of Erfurt to study law, which really pleased his father especially. In 1505, returning to Erfurt after a visit to his parents, Luther was caught in a thunderstorm. He was almost killed by a bolt of lightning. He was scared and out of despair made a vow, praying, Send Anne, send Anne, save me, and I will become a monk. So, he was saved. And he became a monk in the Augustinian order. It's well known that Luther was a very dedicated monk, as well as a very tormented one. Some of the questions he was struggling with were, how can I know that I am saved? How can I be right with God? Or who is man before God's creation? Who am I before God's creation? As Luther was well versed in ancient languages, he was sent in 1508 to the recent founded University of Wittenberg, in Saxony, that was founded just six, year, six years earlier by Frederick the Wise, the Prince Elector of Saxony. An important factor to mention, according to Carl Truman, was that Frederick the Wise held a very important position as the Prince Elector, and he was very important in terms of offering Luther protection and safety in, it, in his territory. In 1510 or 11, Luther travels to Rome, and he has um, <clears throat> a very moving and conflicted experience there. Because he always had dreamed about Rome and its beauty and its how sacred it was. And he, got, he gets there and he sees corruption and poverty and inequality. So he's very frustrated by that. It's also important to say that in his time in Wittenberg, where he would spend the rest of his life, Luther had free access to the scriptures. So... The emblematic year of 1517, on the 31st of October, he nailed his 95 theses about indulgences on the door of the castle church in Wittenberg. And that's a document we'll be thinking a little bit more in a minute. And he also sent a letter to the Archbishop of Mainz explaining the reason why he wrote the, uh, these theses. We'll come back to, to that year in a minute. In August 1518, he was called to Rome to explain and recant his works before the Pope. He knew that the journey would be too, too dangerous, so instead they negotiated for Luther, Luther to be interrogated in German soil in October uh, 1518 in the Diet of Augsburg. There, he was interrogated by Cardinal Caetan, one of the great intellects of the Renaissance and perhaps the most influential interpreter of Thomas Aquinas in the history of the church. He then found that Frederick the Wise would not surrender Luther into his custody because the Saxons did not consider him an heretic. So it was, was very complicated politically as well. He's a bit enlarged by the years, <laughs> as you can tell. So in... In 1520, and this year of 1520 was a very important year in terms of his theological production. 
he had developed three treatises that extended his reflections on the, the urgent need for a reformation and expanded his critiques towards the Roman Catholic Church, theologically and ecclesiologically. So 1517, he was trying really to reform and to warn the Pope what was going on. In 1520, his, the, the, the agenda, the project is clear. He wants a reformation. So he writes in that year uh, uh, a book, an article called The Babylon Cap Captivity of the Church. It was his sacramental manifesto. So he changes, or he, he proposed that from seven sacraments of the, the Catholic Church, they would have just two. So it would be baptism and uh, Holy, the Lord's Supper. And then an appeal to German nobility, to the German nobility. He urged the German authorities and elites to take part in the Reformation against the Roman political control. Here, his attacks against the church and its corruption and against the Pope, they increased. So he wrote, quote, Even the rule of the Antichrist could not be more scandalous. In Rome, the devil himself is in charge. He's very strong. Right? Very strong. <coughs> The freedom of the Christian, he, he writes as well, where he articulates the relationship between faith and works to turn the medieval theology upside down, affirming faith as a more important thing or, uh, than works in matters of salvation. In 1521, the Diet of Worms, to use the German pronunciation here, so <clears throat> by, in that year he was excommunicated by the church, but he was invited by the German emperor Charles V and was brought in a, uh, to a great audience of politicians, theologians, and priests. All of his writings were brought to the audience and he was asked whether he would recant, which, mean, which means deny his positions, his works, or not. Which was a bit strange because he, were, he was already out of the church, so it was very uncommon. To, to call someone that was already excommunicated. But he, anyway, he was provoking this turmoil. And then he said, I, I, originally I would play a clip to you from the film, but we don't, we don't have time for that. So stick with my reading here. And then he said, it's very famous uh, saying by Luther, unless I am convinced by the testimony of the scriptures or by clear reason, for I do not trust either in the Pope or in councils alone, it is, since it's well known that they have often erred and contradicted themselves, I am bound by the scriptures I have quoted, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not retract anything, since it's, since it's neither safe nor right to go against conscience. Here I stand, I can do no other. So this famous discourse, speech, <laughs> here I stand. On, he, on his way back to Wittenberg after the Diet of Worms, Luther was kidnapped by his allies and was taken to stay hidden in a castle for around a year. There he grew a long beard and dressed as a knight. And there he translated the New Testament into German. And that's a very, very important thing for the Reformation. In December 1522, a year later, he visited Wittenberg in disguise in order to see the developments of Re the Reformation. <laughs> He was shocked to see that Kaustadt was leading the Reformation more like a social revolution than a Reformation. Luther associated that with their view of the Lord's Supper as only a symbol and a disconnection between the Spirit and the Word. That in many senses might have been the reason why Luther was so harsh on Zwingli, the Zurich reformer. For Luther, an emphasis on the Spirit without the Word would lead to an uncontrolled uh, no control of subjectivity. Sorry, just missed that. 1525, we're progressing his clash with Erasmus. We won't have time to explore here around the will. Yeah, I don't know very much about that. We can come to that. If you, if you know more about that, you can explain to us. He marries. Uh, he, he gets married to an ex-nun, so Katharina von Bora. From 1527 onwards, Luther engaged in a tough theological debate against Zurich the Zurich reformed Zwingli, as I, as I said. In 1529 was held um, a, a meeting in Marburg that gathered Luther, 
Zwingli, Melanchthon, Bützer and other theologians, both German and Swiss, to try to, to have an agreement. There were 15 points to be debated. There was an agreement in 14.5. <laughs> Half point was to do with the Lord's Supper. No meaningful alliance was possible. The division in Marburg was the first big division within Protestantism. Now we have Lutheran and Reformed. And later Reformed would be associated more to Geneva than Zurich. <clears throat> Sorry guys, I'm just behind the slides. 1530, the Augsburg Confession. The Confession was the synthesis of the Reformers' beliefs and was adopted by the Lutheran princes in Germany, which granted Luther safety until his death in 1546. For some authors, 1530 is the the official acknowledgement of the Lutheran Church and therefore of the Reformation and the Protest Protestantism as a whole. Theological and philosophical picture, we're moving on. That's Pope Leo X, by the way, if you just if you were wondering. The one he 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 addressed the ninety five thesis to. Well, yeah, what's what's right. So the big controversy around indulgences. <clears throat> so the indulgency con controversy uh, in, is in the, at the core, in the core of the Reformation. But a question that would be useful for us to ask, what is an indulgency? That's very important. To understand that, we have to understand what is the sacrament of penance. And I will follow here this Oxford scholar called Andrew Atherstone. So, the sacrament of penance was formally defined by the Council of Florence in 1439 of consisting of four steps. So, you have contrition, uh, the heartfelt sorrow for have sinned and a determination not to sin again. So, there was this very important part, was a very personal thing, contrition. The second step was confession and a spoken admission to a priest of every sin committed. So you have to come to an ordained priest and confess your sin. Third step would be satisfaction. Acts of reparation decreed by the priest, such as fasting, prayer, going on pilgrimage, depending on how, yeah, how big was your sin. So the priest would tell you, so that was a terrible sin. So you have to, I don't know, maybe do a pilgrimage to the Holy Land or just uh, a fast every week would do, I don't know. And the fourth step would be absolution, which would be the forgiveness pronounced by the priest. Ego te absolvio a pecatus tuis. I forgive your sins, something like that. <clears throat> so an indulgence was a certificate given by the church that would deal with the third step of penance, the satisfaction. An indulgence would eliminate or partially eliminate the acts of reparation decreed by the priest. And that would only be possible because of the merits of Christ and the, and the saints who had too much accumulated in their account in terms of good works. So the church could offer these merits to its members. Besides, in 1476, just 25, uh, 35 years before or 40 years before the Reformation, uh, um, a bull pronu pronounced by the Pope called Salvator Nostis extended the scope of the indulgences not only to the living, but also to the dead, so their time in purgatory could be reduced. From that comes the famous sentence, when the coin in the coffer rings, a soul from the purgatory springs. So that was a very famous one back then. Luther experienced this sacrament not only as a theologian on an ivory tower, so to speak, but as a desperate sinner in search for forgiveness and salvation. The question, how can I be right with God, tormented him. And the gospel did not look like good news, but bad news of a just and mighty God who would crush sinners. His evangelical break breakthrough was through his reading of Romans and from the understanding that God's righteousness is not lived out by works, but is a gift that comes from God through faith. 
The whole medieval system of sacraments was deconstructed and seen as a mere human effort. This led Luther to the conclusion that God's righteousness was not something to be feared, but was a good gift which enabled sinners to be counted as righteous before God. And that's the justification by faith alone, or sola fides. Right. Five theses that would encapsulate that reality. Thesis number one. When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, Repent, He willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. So it's instead of just do penance, repent. It's the whole of life should be of repentance. Thesis 32. Those who believe that they can be certain of their salvation because they have indulgence letters will be eternally damned together with their teachers. Very strong language. Saying no, that's, that's wrong. 36. Any truly repentant Christian has a right to full remission of penalty and guilt even without indulgency letters. Just to mention a thing. In the beginning... The problem of indulgences was a pastoral problem for Luther. Because in Saxony, it was not allowed to sell indulgences. So people would go across the border to the next county to buy indulgences. So he was seeing his parishioners going there. and he, he was strongly annoyed by that. 43. Christians are to be taught that he who gives to the poor or lends, or lends to the needy does a better deed than he who buys indulgences. Can you manage that? It, it looks so clear to us, but that was the main, one of the main means of fundraising for reuniting the church for St. Peter Basilica. And this German monk is challenged that. It was a big deal. 50. Christians are to be taught that if the Pope knew the exactions of the indulgence preachers, he would rather that the Basilica of St. Peter were burned to ashes than to build up with the skin flesh and bones of his sheep. So back then he was trying to warn the Pope of what was going on. Of course, later on he broke with that and, and he criticized very strongly the Pope. He would later develop his more his stronger philosophical and theological elaboration against scholasticism, Thomas Aquinas and Aristotle and the Pope himself. Final part of this lecture anthropological picture that comes and we can see in the Reformation. Are you still awake? Yes, 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 yes good, well done. So the Reformation emphasis on sola scriptura and the universal access to God's word gave a lot of space for the individual to be thought of as an individual before God and not only as part of a big system. The reformers, like Luther, believed that rationality was an important gift given to humans by God. Although the reality of our sinful nature should prevent us from trusting on reason alone. I think that's a very important difference. Rationality is a gift, but could not, as some humanists of the Renaissance did, be understood as a trustworthy way in itself. Man needs God to understand his own identity, his imago Dei. With the Reformation, there was a fresh emphasis in the theology of creation, or if you like, in the theology of culture. The daily life and nature were given their proper place, as expressed in the development of Protestant art, as well as Luther's passion for music. Man was not divided between nature and grace, but was part of God's creation, affected by sin, but being restored in the ex expectation of Christ's return and redemption. And we can, we can see this expression of anthropological understanding of the Reformation from the art that comes from the, 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 the Protestant artists. We have here the, the idea of the sacredness of the whole of life. So the whole of life is under Christ, so even kind of, Laughter in family, family together, a bit messy there. So that's, that's part of God's creation. It should be celebrated as part of the intention of uh, the Creator to, to humanity. So even the simple daily tasks would be as sacred as kind of being a priest. 
So the, this idea of um, vocation. So we are, everything we do is for the glory of God and His creation. So we have this idea of, yeah, human, human personality, the beauty of a person. Not because it's a <coughs> rational, intellectual, um, glorious thing, but because it's the Imago Dei being reflected there. Right, and then my last slide. I'll read that to you. Both the Renaissance and the Reformation are key events in the transformation of the world because both dealt with central aspects of the Middle Ages. <coughs> I read from that. It might be a bit different from, that from different perspectives, nevertheless. Responding and transforming its main theological foundation, nature and grace, that encompass a view of nature, of mankind, and of the Church. The Renaissance reemphasized the place of nature, seeing an autonomous and rational man as the glory of it. However, they struggled to connect both of them, giving space for the later modern humanist to be developed, which alienated creation from its creator. The Reformation, on the other hand, criticized the theological-philosophical foundation of the Middle Ages, which was represented by the Aristotelian scholastic theology. By reforming the understanding of the place of the church, the Reformation helped to reshape social structures that would be later developed in modern times. At the same time, the Reformation gave space to subjectivity and the place of mankind in God's creation. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to this message by the Cantaro Institute. Please feel free to share it with friends, but do not commercialize or alter this material without the express written consent of the Cantaro Institute.